This is KGW News at Noon. I have concluded that this battle for the Democratic nomination will not be successful. Bernie Sanders officially dropping out of the presidential race. So that clears the way for Joe Biden to clinch the Democratic nomination. Good afternoon to you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Nina Melhoff in for Brenda today. The Vermont Senator made that announcement during a live stream video this morning, calling the decision to quit difficult and painful. He also said a path toward the Democratic nomination was virtually impossible. Sanders leaves the race with 914 delegates. That's compared to Biden's 1,217. A candidate needs 1,991 delegates to win the party's nomination. Over the past few weeks, Jane and I, in consultation with top staff and many of our prominent supporters, have made an honest assessment of the prospects for victory. If I believed we had a feasible path to the nomination, I would certainly continue the campaign, but it's just not there. He went on to say he will work with Joe Biden to move progressive ideas forward, but stop short of officially endorsing him. Now to the latest on the coronavirus pandemic. Cases here in the Northwest continue to grow slowly. Almost 9,000 people in Washington have it. 408 people have died. That's according to Johns Hopkins University, which has been tracking the cases since the crisis began. In Oregon, there are at least 1,100 confirmed cases. That's out of more than 23,000 tests. 33 Oregonians have died. And a new report shows Oregon will only get half of the coronavirus tests Governor Kate Brown promised from a private commercial lab. That's according to records obtained by the Oregonian. Back on March 18th, Governor Brown said on live television the Oregon Health Authority had signed a contract for 20,000 tests with a private provider. But really, the state didn't sign the contract with Quest Diagnostics until two weeks later on April 1st. On top of that, the deal with the lab turned out to be half that amount, 10,000 tests. According to the Oregonian, the governor's chief of staff apologized, saying their office did not intend to misinform Oregonians. Meanwhile, Governor Brown will hold a press conference at one o'clock today. She's expected to talk about education issues during this coronavirus crisis. We're going to carry that press conference live on the air. We'll also live stream it on our social media pages. All right, new at noon today, Salem's public transit system has announced anyone who wants to ride has to be wearing a face mask starting Friday or they won't be let on. Chariots bus drivers are also required to wear them, plus gloves, and they're also only boarding and exiting through the rear doors so passengers and drivers can stay as far apart as possible. COVID-19 cases in the U.S. have now surpassed 400,000. And while that number may seem grim, some areas are seeing a flattening of the curve, meaning they're growing um, slower. White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator Dr. Deborah Burks spoke on the Today Show this morning. We know Washington and California started very early, went to social distancing very early. Their curves look like they are persistently flat, and that's very encouraging for us. New York remains the hardest hit. It reported 731 deaths yesterday alone. More than 4,000 people have died there. That's more than any in the 9-11 terror attack. But New York's governor says new cases and hospitalizations appear to be plateauing, so the city may be reaching its peak. Well, the situation there has people all around the country looking for ways to help. And that includes a doctor who has family in Portland and volunteered to fly from his hospital in Chicago to New York to help. And he's giving us unique insight into what it's like in the worst hit part of the country. And it may be hard to hear, but it's important. KGW's Mike Benner has the story. These patients are coming in at such an alarming rate, a staggering rate. Between shifts at an undisclosed New York City area hospital, Dr. Luke Northern spoke with our Dan Haggerty about working on the front lines in the epicenter of the U.S. coronavirus outbreak. It is just um, overwhelming would be the word. Absolutely, unbelievably overwhelming. 
Dr. Northern describes an overcrowded hospital. He says patient after patient is intubated as soon as they arrive, others just a few days later, and there's simply no room for them. There's an ICU at the hospital I'm at now with 12 beds. That's overrun. They made a second ICU with 16 beds. That's overrun. The ER is full of these patients with tubes in them. And so many of these patients, the doctor says, are dying without family by their side. And because the deceased can't go to funeral homes right away, they're moved into trucks outside the hospital. I'm at a loss to describe the words of what that does to you, what that, how that makes you feel. And um, I, I don't know if there are any words um, to, to come out there and to see something like that um, other than just uh, profound sadness um, for our country, for the world, and uh, for these patients. One of the few things giving Dr. Northern hope, the doctors and nurses he's working alongside. He says they are doing a tremendous job, but adds... People are just kind of at their wits end. Um, It's um, very taxing on them um, emotionally, physically. It's taxing on their families. It's certainly taxing on Dr. Northern's wife and three kids back in Chicago. You see, that is where he is from. But he volunteered to fly to New York to work in the ICU with COVID-19 patients. Why, you ask? He points to 9-11. I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything to help my country. I just kind of sat there and watched like the rest of us. And uh, I vowed that if something like that ever happened again, and if I had the ability to help, I would help. And Dr. Northern is doing just that. And he says we can help, too, by continuing to social distance. Hopefully this can be a time for us to, you know, rally around each other, um, not just for our country, but um, around the world and uh, just uh, love each other and become better. Dr. Northern plans to volunteer until late April. And listen to this. It turns out he's not the only medical professional in his family. His parents, who used to work at several different hospitals here in the Portland area, are currently working at hospitals in California, and his brother is doing the same in Pittsburgh. A big thank you to all of them and everybody else on the front lines. I'm Mike Benner for KGW News. Yes, we second that. Well, there is growing concern. The case numbers, both here and around the country, don't fully reflect what's happening. That's because of false negative test results. Health officials in many states have been reporting that more than 90% of people who get tested don't have the virus. But almost a third of people who got a negative result may actually be infected. If someone has the disease and has the test, 70% of the time the test will be positive, and 30% of the time it will be negative. Well, that's hard to know. A testing lab we spoke with says the accuracy can be influenced by a number of things, including the quality of the testing sample provided. Health experts say if you have symptoms, you should assume you have the virus and go into quarantine. The most common symptoms are fever, a dry cough, and fatigue. Well, we get so many new questions from you every day about the coronavirus. So here's Kristen Severance with another batch of answers. Let's answer some viewer questions now. So this viewer wants to know, is six foot distancing guidelines still appropriate since the new information says that the virus could be carried on droplets simply from talking, not just sneezing or coughing? Thank you, Dave Taylor, for that question. This is something I wonder too. The short answer, according to Dr. Claire Wheeler, who has been answering so many of your questions, she's from PSU and OHSU. She says the short answer is no. This is why we all need to wear masks when we're not at home. The bottom line is that we really don't know with absolute certainty who is infectious, when they become infectious, or how the virus moves through the population. Next question is an interesting one. This person says, my hair salon is reopening and making appointments starting April 16th. Are they able to do that under Governor Brown's order? When can businesses start reopening under the existing executive order? Okay, so according to the rules set by the governor, grooming businesses, including salons, they should be closed right now. And Governor Brown has said 
that she wants to wait to lift the order when we have 10 days of no death. So no, this business should not be opening April 16th. Next question. I've been reading articles about this COVID-19 mutating. They say that scientists have discovered other versions of COVID-19 that have mutated already. Is this true? Thank you, Leah, for that question. So while the flu virus is a superstar at mutating away from our immune protection, fortunately, doctors say this virus is not. They say that the RNA structure and the proteins it codes for appear to be very stable. That means it's very likely that a vaccine we develop in the months to come and distribute 12 to 18 months from now will still be effective. Please keep sending in those questions. We do our very best to answer them. And if you have a question that we did not answer right now, go to kgw.com forward slash answers and you can see all the questions that we've answered so far.